Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Cole uh, at the University of Illinois. I am at Banks Librarian and Professor in the University Library. And I'm an affiliate professor in our high school's so Center for um, um, Research in Information Research and Science and Scholarship. And I better make sure I'm muted too. Okay. Um, at the W3C, I'm past co chair of the Web Annotation Working Group, co editor of a technical note issued by that working group, and currently the co editor of a prospective new recommendation being developed by the recently chartered publishing working group. This is an update on the release of the W3C web annotation standards and an early look at the ongoing web publications uh, working group work um, currently underway at the W3C. In regard to the latter, before I forget and get, get into the main presentation, let me acknowledge that I've liberally ripped off the slides created by two of the co-chairs of the working group, uh, as well as uh, Dave Kramer of Ishet and Yvonne Herman of the W3C. So uh, I'll be focusing on developments in the last 12 to 16 months, but regular CNI attendees will be well aware that a lot of groundwork for the web annotation <coughs> specs was laid through the most of the last decade um, by a lot of people. A major effort provided by many, many individuals. So provide a little context for those of you who are not familiar with the recent developments in web annotation. This is my single history slide. Several projects led to the chartering of the Web Annotation Working Group started with the Mellon Foundation funded uh, open annotation collaboration project that began in 2009 with Jane Hunter, Herbert Von Ensemble, Neil Freistadt, Dan Cohen, Rob Sanderson, and myself as the PIs. In 2010, the Annotation Ontology Initiative based at Harvard and Manchester got underway, uh, Paolo Ticarisi and Tim Clark and others. Uh, in 2011, Dan Whaley founded um, uh, a Hypothesis, um, which works extensively with annotation now. By 2012, the Open Knowledge Foundation had released JavaScript-based annotation tools. Um, and by 2013, we were seeing work from coming out of Europeana and other areas in Europe which led to the notorious image annotation libraries and the pundit annotation tool. 2013 also saw the first IANTIC conference and the creation of the W3C uh, Open Annotation Community Group and separately the creation within W3C of the Digital Publishing Interest Group to begin exploring web publishing issues. So we built up a lot of momentum by 2014 the W3C had a meeting about this to say critical mass with regard to web annotation had been reached and chartered the web annotation working group. The working group then was able to leverage all the activity and the interest uh, led to the release in February of this year of um, the recommendations and specs, three recommendations and two notes from the working group. Um, and also led to um, uh, the development and furtherance of the publishing interest activities and so the chartering in June of the uh, <coughs> publishing working group. Very quickly I'm going to show you the specs and then talk a little bit about them. So let me enumerate the web annotation <coughs> specs uh, published in February. First the web annotation data model which gives developers both annotation of, of both annotation clients and servers a lingua franca to exchange web annotations. The web annotation vocabulary, which is the formal ontology that underpins the data model. The DMET data model is RDF and linked open data compliant. A web annotation protocol, a framework at this point a little loose for connecting annotation clients to annotation servers. And I'll say one or two words about this. The working group also issued a note describing particularly the submodel for specifying segments of resources, known as specific resources in the model. Uh, when you're talking about segments of a resource that you want to body, use the target or a body of an annotation. Uh, and finally, a uh, summary note describing possible approaches for embedding web annotations in HTML. Uh, this presentation, which will be up on the uh, CNI website soon, 
Um, I've included, for those of you who like reading WCC specs, and, and God help you, by the way, I include the URLs you can use to find these specs. Have at it. For others who want just a sense of what these documents are about, let me give you the 10 minute tour, and, and you can ask me more questions at lunch or later. And I'm also going to talk a little about the implementations we're seeing emerge. So at core, there's a very simple idea. And those of you who've seen Herbert or Rob talk about this work over the years will have seen this, this diagram. Um, but let me highlight three kind of critical facets in this very simple model. First, every annotation is itself um, an object on the web, which can be in turn annotated, shared, and stored separately from the content being annotated. And that's important. Um, second, uh, the body, the contents, the comment, if you will, if it's a simple comment of annotation, is not necessarily part of the annotation object itself, but is addressable. It's in its own little box there. It's an addressable object in its own right um, that can be referenced. And in some cases, if you're, for example, tagging, it may be a tag in an ontology somewhere else entirely. Third, annotations have a structure, and so they can't really be captured as a simple URI. Instead, the data model specifies serializing annotations uh, in JSON-LD, linked data version of JSON-LD, of JavaScript object notation. A brief anecdote about this last point. The Web Annotation Working Group Charter was presented to the W3C Advisory Committee in April 2014. The AC is composed of a rep from every W3C member. Doug Shepherds and I presented the charter at the AC meeting in Boston that year. During the Q&A, someone from the audience got up and volunteered that they knew of the perfect scheme for defining annotation targets and annotations. It's similar to how fragment identifiers work. You just put double hash marks instead of a single hash mark, and you do this and that, this and that, and everyone will be happy, and we'll just be done luckily split, no working group. What we needed. <clears throat> At that point, someone from the back of the room piped in with, and you'll break the, if we do that, we'll break the web. The someone turned out to be Tim Berners-Lee. <laughs> the um, annotation review went favorably. The AC decided to charter the working group, and we went forward from there. But now you know why we don't try to make URIs out of annotations. We actually use JSON. Um, OK, all well, very nice in the abstract, but concretely, what kind of things can you do with the web annotation data model? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I want to show you a little bit of what annotations look like uh, in this uh, data model. Simple use cases are relatively straightforward and, in fact, almost human readable. To be clear, annotations are created and consumed by software, but some simple annotations are easily comprehended at a glance. For example, there's the idea of a bodiless um, annotation shown in the upper left corner of this slide. Um, we were surprised when we began the open annotation collaboration that even among scholars, this is a very common and important use case, just empty bookmarking, just like flashing a highlighter or circling something in text. Okay. So here you have a four-line annotation, as simple as you get. The first and third key, context and type, have fixed values, and they're the same in all annotations. The ID key gives identity to the annotation. The last key, then, is the important one. That's the target. Here is simple URL. Uh, the web page being, being annotated. Okay. For some of the more complicated annotations, like sticky note kind of things, uh, there are two options. The lower right shows what's called a body value annotation. It's a shorthand that may be used when the comment is plain text and extremely simple. You don't need to talk about the language of text. You don't want to reference the, the uh, comment later on separately. Um, lower left is a longhand version of the same annotation. This pattern has advantages if you want to annotate with Markdown or HTML, like you want to include bold or italics in your, in your comment text, identify the language of your content, or be able to reference this annotation, this body separately. Uh, and of course, critically, the model allows then on both the annotation itself and on the bodies that you create for annotations, the ability to provide provenance. Who created it, when they created it, that kind of thing. Okay. More complex annotations then require more complex JSON, the way it should work. One of the more powerful features of the annotation model is the concept of specific resource descriptions. 
essentially locators for finding and identifying resource segments in the annotation target of body. I won't take time to detail how this works, but if you have questions, see me, see me over lunch or drop me a note. This just illustrates that the model does anticipate different ways you might want to target text or graphics or whatever. You can talk about byte streams, you can talk about text streams, you can talk about code selectors, uh, and so on. And um, even provides advice, advice in the model on how to extend this within a particular community. Similarly, the model provides a means to deal with multiple bodies and targets, which comes up in more complex scenarios. Or, as illustrated in this example, tag the motivation for creating the annotation and or tag the role of each body in a multi-body annotation. This part of the model, the, the motivation and purpose, is almost certainly underspecified. Uh, there's a paper that Alan Renier, Jacob Jett, Dave Dubin, and I did at the 2016 balance side proceedings about this. But the reality is that there are only a few tools actually sophisticated enough to allow experimentation with how motivation and purpose might be used. So for the working group, we felt like more experience was needed before we could get more sophisticated than this fairly simplistic model. Okay. Go a lot more depth about the model, but I didn't have time today, so I want to change and mention the protocol briefly. Um, at a high level, this document is about how annotation clients and servers interact. So the protocol spec talks about what a client application, an annotation tool, can do with an annotation once created, how it might send it to the server, and how that tool could also go to that server and discover if there are other annotations involving a resource of interest. The protocol is based on the W3C Link Data Platform recommendation. It was written to follow the five basic uh, principles laid out here. Stay consistent with the architecture of the web, follow REST best practices, expect annotation clients to talk to servers using HTTP, protocol the web, and vice versa. Take maximum advantage of existing specifications. And while keeping it simple is a priority for us, we realize these first four um, principles really take precedence for the most part. Jermaine to Cliff's comments yesterday about annotations and security of annotations and privacy, the protocol does not define how to do that. Instead, the protocol, like most uh, current W3 recommendations, including the, w the Link Data Platform specification, relies on the built-in um, mechanisms of HTTP to manage permissions to annotate and so on. Basically, if somebody tries to do something um, using your annotation tool, and send an annotation to the server, the server has a right to say, you haven't authenticated yet, I'm not going to let you do that. And use HTTP to authenticate. <coughs> so I want to turn to the testing that we did as part of this process before we published the recommendations as final recommendations. And uh, a little bit about implementations that we're seeing emerge that are using um, the specs. At the W3C, testing is not about uh, proving the technical viability or correctness, or I mean, sorry, it is about proving the technical viability of a recommendation. It's not about proving the correctness of the recommendation in a more uh, higher level sense. It's basically about ensuring that required features that you talk about in the recommendation can and have been implemented. So we don't put a recommendation out there that says you're required to do something and it turns out it's very hard or impossible to do. So this is a screenshot, just a fragment of our test report. The link's there if you <coughs> want to go see more. Ten developers submitted JSON created by their implementations, and we tested all the files submitted to see exactly what features they had successfully and correctly implemented among our required feature set. We wrote over 160 tests, each comprised of one or more JSON schema checks, over 300 JSON schema fragments. We um, uh, then made sure that we had at least two implementations of all required specs, or we stripped that requirement out. And there were only a couple that came up that nobody had chosen to implement. <coughs> the first column basically shows the feature, so they wanted to make sure that you could do an embedded textual body and have the required properties that we specified. And there were three schemas that you had to pass in order to do that. Um, 
Then in the right-hand column are the, acro or the abbreviations for the uh, implementations. For that particular required property, four implementations had, had implemented that particular kind of um, uh, body, text body. Uh, for using external resources, the targets and bodies, eight of the ten had done that, and so on. Uh, like I say, you're welcome to go look at the, uh, the actual spec. It's got these nice, at the bottom, it's got these nice little green and red and yellow boxes, very festive to look at this time of year. The other thing we've been pleased to uh, see is the number and diversity of implementations. These are specialized tools um, that have implemented, I'm going to talk about, implemented the web annotation uh, spec, um, at least at parts of it. We've had discussions as well with browser manufacturers, but this stage annotation and annotations require embedded JavaScript libraries or plugins in order to use. Um, still seeing quite a bit of use. <laughs> and we may see some progress on, on that, or we may do some polyfills for uh, showing how they can be used more natively in browsers. This screenshot is from a Hypothesis under their general heading on their website of publishing. It illustrates some of the work that they're doing uh, with publishers um, to do annotations and add annotation features to publishing <coughs> web publishing. In particular, these are some of the partners that have joined with them um, in uh, doing uh, work on annotations in their, their applications. And as of last week, you can actually add Ingenta to this list. Um, Hypothesis, for those who don't know, it's founded by Dan Whaley, is a nonprofit and does everything open source. So the, um, uh, uh, they have a nice GitHub repository. You can actually contribute under certain terms to their code base if you want to, and you can borrow from it and use it uh, in your own, own tools and applications. Another application is an Italian, pro Italian project started several years ago called Pundant. Uh, got started in part with help from Europeana. Um, it's very similar to Hypothesis. And actually, one thing they've done that's very interesting is some interoperability experiments. Tag it or annotate it in both Hypothesis and Pundit and use the other client to see what it looks like. And that, that seems to work very well. Very good proof of concept to show the interoperability, which after all is one of the main purposes of these specs. They have a GitHub repository, works primarily in AngularJS and a developer site. So again, open source software uh, may be of interest. Here's a relatively new initiative within Europeana, an API for annotating any object in Europeana. It's at the very early alpha stage right now, but watch this space over the next uh, six, 12 months. They do expect to get to mature beta um, in 2018. So we'll see that work. And that's very interesting to see an API that allows you to create the annotations of European objects and store them with them, with the uh, with European. And again, both a GitHub repository and a nice Google discussion forum for European API. This is something you may be familiar with in other contexts, the um, International Imaging Interoperability Framework Initiative. Um, Rob Sanderson, one of the chief instigators and architects of IIIF, was also co-editor of the web annotation specs as well as co-chair of the Web Annotation Working Group. The reason is because in IIIF, in the presentation API, as it describes, um, annotations are used basically to associate images with the canvas, which is the underlying model of IIIF, uh, called Shared Canvas, originally when it was first worked on. Um, so this is a, a, a very interesting use of annotation a little bit novel, and as known over here, he's already at work. And by the way, um, Rob is just finishing uh, his uh, uh, paternal paternity leave. He should actually be here co-presenting this with me, um, but he had some familiar <coughs> obligations. He says hi. But it's given lots of time for him to go and work on the next spec of the presentation API. Uh, that'll be out next year, and it will bring it fully into line with the latest the final recommendations that came out of the W3C uh, uh, web annotation work. Finally, just a real brief plug for one of my own projects with an acknowledgement to the general support of the general support of the scholarly communications program at the Andrew Mellon Foundation. We've been transforming our now venerable cold proofed archive into RDF as a step toward making better use of linked open data. This is an archive built from digitizing uh, Professor Philip Kolb's notes that he and his students took over 25 or 30 years uh, in the last century. 
basically 20,000 or so note cards, literally note cards. Um, they've been digitized, put into TI initially, now into RDF, and they mention a lot of people, more than 7,000 names associated with Marcel Proust, his writings, his letters, his life and times. Um, in fact, Kolb uh, was the editor of I think more than 20 volumes of the compiled man uh, correspondence of um, Marcel Proust. We've gone in and our into RDF, and now we're starting to mine this information and looking for linkages to BIF, to Wikipedia, and so on, and finding that. And we're identifying what families the various names are associated, many of the prominent families of the time, like the Rothschilds. This is just a, a way of visualizing some of that. Every note on here is a family that has a member that is mentioned on the same card with one of the Rothschilds were mentioned on 43 of his cards. Obviously, the next thing you want to do is begin to um, annotate this graph. And again, different than annotating pages of text or even images. Uh, this is kind of fun. This just shows a couple of screenshots from a very crude interface we've been working on for this. Uh, a screenshot in the upper right where I'm about to add a comment to the Rothschilds node. Uh, and then the lower left, as we get links as annotations, we can build those into the right context key so you can link out to like Wikipedia entries that have been added by annotation. And finally, in terms of implementation, before I turn to the publishing work at W3C, let me just mention uh, that Apache Annotator Incubator has been established to see if we can get web annotation libraries into the Apache software, software universe. This will allow us to do more work on annotation services in particular and potentially make it relatively simple to configure servers to capture, for example, annotations people want to make about content or some part of your content on your website. The incubator project is not proceeding as fast as we had hoped, but it is proceeding. We get a lot of input from the hypothesis folks, from uh, Benjamin Young and Wiley, from other people, and I'm hoping this, this ends up being yet another avenue to see the influence of these recommendations on interoperable annotations. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes that I have left um, turning my attention to the web publishing activities within W3C, which have been around for a while but have gotten a big boost this year due to a couple of reasons. Okay. In particular, the Web Annotation Work Group showed some interest in some viability for annotation, which is important to publishing. And then in January of this year, the International Digital um, Publication Forum, people who created EPUB, merged with the W3C. And EPUB 4 will now come, now come out of W3C. The changes to EPUB 3.1 will come out of um, W3C. So with that initiative, that, that uh, uh, momentum, the W3C in June uh, chartered a new working group, the publishing working group. Um, in slightly less words than this, this official goal on their charter. Basically, the goal of the publishing working group is bring traditional publishing more into the web world and the open web platform, and bring the open web platform a little closer to traditional publishing. We'll see how that works out. So what's the problem that space that they're really trying to be tackled here? Why can't we just put web publications up to HTML pages and we're done? A lot of people in the W3C community think that's the right answer. Just put it up there, add some JavaScript, and you've got a perfectly fine platform for um, uh, publishing traditional journals, books, everything else. Um, it's not entirely clear. It's true. It doesn't deal with the fact that there are other things besides browsers that use the web, like reading platforms. Um, and basically, the web is very resource-centric, <coughs> where resources are conceived of as single, simple objects basically a file like an HTML source. There are ancillary files like style sheets and, and, and JavaScript that are basically help, to help you present that, render that file. But they're not containing the content for the most part. The content generally is in the um, resource that you get, whether it's drawn from a database or an HTML resource. Web publications are a little bit different in the sense that structure is more complex, structure is more important. What if you have an intellectual object, say a book, with chapters or an article with sections and proofs and embedded video, each of those separate files. Now you have to worry about whole part relationships, first, next, last reading order, 
conditional sequencing for certain kinds of, of uh, modern books, offline reading of books. The open web platform, sophisticated as it is, is not fully adapted to treat such objects well. Currently, EPUB basically wants to treat all internal resources, XHTML file, and zip everything else and call it a day. That also is limiting. So, um, what we're trying to do here is find a way to talk about resources that contain other resources that are publication in nature in a sensible fashion that can be rendered by the various systems. The working group has been charged to create at least four deliverables. We have a fifth deliverable in process as well. And um, you know, it's an outgrowth of the web adaptation work. But the four required deliverables are listed here. EPUB 4 will come out before this working group is finished. Another important deliverable is the area, EPUB area uh, deliverable, which makes, is designed to make EPUBs and everything else much more accessible. Okay. Version 1 of that is now being voted on based on work done with the interest group. Area is the interest or the, the group within W3C that does accessibility work. Very optimistic, very pleased by what's happening there. Version 2 will come out over the next two years. Uh, in trying to achieve its deliverables, the web publishing market group is looking at several items, okay? A um, number of technical issues, some of which are listed here. For locating and identifying segments within a web publication, we're going to borrow heavily from web annotation. Um, note also the mention of archiving. I was talking to Nick, Nick earlier. Um, we need more help. We need more librarians in general in the publishing working group. We definitely need archives and things like, or experts on things like archiving. If you know any, please prod them talk to me. Um, at the very least, we'd like to get their input, uh, which they can provide even without being part of the W3C, because the work is done transparently, transparently in the open. There are a lot of publishers involved in this, with the joining of IDPF, a lot joined W3C. And while they all agree that the web is wonderful, they do not want to lose the idea that the web is also still, and always will be, they hope, a web of documents, like publications. So the members of the working group think about things in a document or in a fashion. This is interesting to see how this meshes in our meetings and our calls with people who don't think about document-centric web anymore. At the same time, there's no false sense that everything is or should be an EPUB. The web publishing group is not just creating EPUB 4. They're creating a more general specification for web publications, more generally, and for packaged web publications. Web publications that are created and often little and offline but that can be expanded and brought to the web because they were created in the right way. We're also looking at prior art. Um, the open web platform service workers, web application manifest, HTML nav tags, link references. Um, we're looking at what EPUB did with manifest and spine, conical fragment identifiers. Um, we're looking at personalization, what browsers are doing, uh, as well as accessibility personalization efforts looking at the annotations, <coughs> offline again, and arrays of objects and so on. So that's kind of where the web publishing just getting started. In January, we release our first public working drafts of at least two, hopefully three specs. Please take a look at those. Those are transparent and open. Anybody can look at those. Anybody can go to GitHub and comment on them. So look for the publishing working group, find their GitHub site, add to our issues so we do a better job with the specs and think about things like what do libraries have to have to make EPUBs work well. And then think about joining community groups. The nice thing about W3C community groups is you do not have to, have to actually have to be a member of W3C to join a community group. A new community group that just got started, people who work in museums or have segments of libraries that do museum-like work, is the Art and Culture Community Group. Rob Sanderson and a colleague just opened this um, a month ago at TPAC, TPAC, and so it's got 40 members already. They're just getting organized. If these are interesting to you, you might want to join that community group. It's a gateway drug. Um, <laughs> I joined the community group for open annotation, and a year later I managed to get my institution to join W3C, which for nonprofits is not terribly expensive. Um, and then I was able to participate in the working groups, and it was a good thing. Um, to be honest, for those of you at educational institutions, the challenging part of getting to join W3C is less the budget cost than it is getting your Office of Technology Management to sign off on the 
uh, no patents kind of policy, basically. You don't put stuff in W3C that you're going to try to patent. And you have to convince them that what we're doing for W3C is not patentable anyway. So, And I did not leave much time, but there's a couple minutes if people have questions. Thank you.